do you feel any kind of special energy when you're out there or anything like that? So absolutely, there are certain energy zones that are located on Blind Frog Ranch, and there's an energy that you can feel almost anywhere when you're on Skinwalker Ranch. Um, sometimes it seems, or, or I guess would, you would say feels benevolent, other times malevolent. Really? And absolutely. Um, on skin, uh, excuse me, on Blind Frog Ranch, actually they have a location they call the pond. So something's looming over that place. There's a good possibility or, or that there's something there. We've got uh, some caves and portals at Blind Frog Ranch. Take a look. We believe, and there's a lot of evidence about that, both from recent humans, that caves were conceived as portals, as gates to the, to the to the underworld. They conceive the underworld as a world of, of prosperity, of, as, the, as the place of origin of all things. We believe in their opinion, the end of the cave was, was the connection to the netherworld. And they wanted to get this connection in order to, order to communicate and maintain, and, and maintain their relationships with the entities which are at the other side of the world. Animals and geometric signs are the primary subjects of most of these paintings, which were executed with an amazing level of artistic ability, especially considering the time and conditions. While going through the state of consciousness, they saw the animals within their vision, and then they painted them on the wall. They didn't went there in order to see animals. They went there in order to get attached to the cosmos. And via that, they saw things within their vision and they put them on the wall. Andrew Collins, an ancient history researcher and writer on the significance of this study. The greatest takeaway, in my opinion, relating to this study is not so much the fact that they come up with this idea, which is, um, you know, revolutionary in itself, but it's the fact that academics are seriously considering the idea that we are communicating with non-human intelligences and that these entities, these beings may well have been real. Now we have to try and understand exactly what those entities are. What it shows you is, is that there are people out there trying to get those answers you're looking for. Absolutely. Um, you know, when it comes to portals, that's one of my goals in research is to try to locate these. Make the sure you come back, would you? <laughs> I will. But what a lot of people don't realize is the magnetic energy that we have available in certain locations uh, many times are high. And there's a possibility that we have these electron diffusion regions here in the planet, not just out in space. So we have this magnetic energy that's capable of being converted into charged particle energy by heat and kinetic energy being forced through a smaller location, which would be considered a portal. So when we charge this energy and it opens up, it would be something that we would be considering as a vortex or a portal. And I firmly believe that the science is there uh, to show that this can occur. It's just there's certain locations around our planet Northeastern Utah seems to be one of the prime examples where this energy exists. And it just happens? It just happens. So, and I think we discussed it slightly earlier that I believe there was some type of meteor or asteroid impact that brought certain types of material to the location that helps create more of this energy. Um, and you see, you see a lot higher uh, mineralization that's taken place uh, in the Uintah Mountains and the basin including high amounts of gold, and, and what's really interesting is high amounts of iridium, which is rare unless there was a meteor or... And that's very sought after. And it's it? very sought after, exactly. Who did the petroglyphs? So the petroglyphs and the pictographs in that area were the desert archaic people, the Barrier Canyon style and the Fremont. And it's very interesting and unique. Those, are those carved? Those are petroglyphs. They've been carved into the rock art or the rock wall. What's really interesting is what's missing in them. When do you, how old do you think that is, James? I think this is probably anywhere between 2,000 
to a thousand years old, this and, specific And what one. is that object on the left? Absolutely, so remember that when you're talking Looks about like petroglyphs. It's like a spaceship. It does, everything's subjective. But it, when you look at it and you think about it in our current viewpoints that we're aware of, it looks like some type of uh, technology that looks to have landed. It looks to be beaming out something. There looks to be some type of anthropomorphic figure that is coming down from it, meeting up with another anthropomorphic figure. And the zoomorphic figures, which are the animals, seem to be mesmerized by it, not quite understanding what's occurring. Does that look like somebody named Steve? <laughs> and you get um, the vandalism, unfortunately, all, all throughout, no matter where well, you are. Well, how do we know the vandalism place. didn't do everything? It, based upon, well, there's a lot of ways to look at the, you can look at the patina, uh, you can look at the other rock art. You want to look at it all, what you see in the area, not just small sure. amounts of it. And where, where are you here? Here we're at Dry Fork Canyon, uh, just outside of Vernal, Utah. And this is one of the most uh, amazing sets of petroglyphs that were done by the Fremont culture, probably anywhere between zero and 1200 AD. But what's amazing about this one is look what's behind me. It's representing, oh, it's gorgeous. It's representing what I believe to be one of the giants. Uh, it has six digits on its hands and super large feet. The one right behind you. The one, well, they're, they're all giants, but that one specific one looks like giant. And it seems to match what the Nuragic culture in Sardinia okay. showed for their giants. And what's that he got? On. He's got a sword in his hand or something? He has a specific type of weapon and a spear. The helmet and his tunic seem to match what you see that was put out by the Nuragic culture in Sardinia. What's that coming out of his side of his head? Uh, so, so that looks to be some type of helmet that they wore up on top. Um, also, you see that there seems to be that they were head hunting. So they have uh, oh, other indigenous people's heads that they're carrying, which may have been why some of the local tribes uh, considered like the Cite Ka, which were the redhead cannibal giants. Right. Maybe that's where cannibal came from, was due to the fact that they were headhunters. Were they particularly enlightened people? They look to have been. Uh, they look to have been maybe pre-human or humankind uh, where we're currently at, current mankind. Maybe they were a little bit ahead of us and then we had this bleed over where we were with them. And what's interesting is you have certain groups of the giants like the Starnake, which were told were mining giants in that area that used tools that made sound. Well, that tells me that they had pneumatic or hydraulic or electric power that they were using for that. You also have the Cite Ka which were the redhead cannibal giants. You have in Mesoamerica, you have the Uemas and the Kinametsen. Right. But what you see is you see a reduction in height taking place as it gets closer to our current time because the Native Americans say, and even the Spaniards came across these redheaded giants all the way until the middle 1800s in Nevada and Utah. So what that's telling me is at some point it looks like in order to survive, they had to mate with Homo sapien. Um, and that was where that reduction in height started to occur. Sounds like a biblical story, doesn't it? It, it absolutely does, Strange. it sure matches.